Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I'm the Assistant Director for the Medical Cannabis Research Center here at Drexel University. Today, we're happy to be joined by Peter Tejera and Dr. Jeffrey Raber. Um, they are both on the advisory board for uh, one of Drexel's um, research projects out in Los Angeles uh, called Kaya. Um, first, we'll start off with Peter Tejera. He is a cannabis professional boasting over 25 years of experience within the cannabis industry, uh, everything from retail, um, to real estate, uh, business development. Um, certainly, we'll let him uh, dive a little bit deeper into his background, but just a brief overview there. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Raber uh, is a graduate of Lebanon Valley College, as well as uh, University of Southern California, uh, mainly focusing on uh, chemistry. Um, he also owns a biotech company um, that provides independent testing services uh, to the cannabis industry. Um, we're very happy to have them here today, and I'll pass it off uh, to start with Peter. Uh, looking forward to hear some lessons learned from uh, California. Oh, great. Good. Thanks, Jim. Uh, as uh, Jim said, I'm uh, Peter Tejera. I'm the founder of Herbal Cure, which was the first vertically integrated collective in Los Angeles. We're also the, the only, I believe at the time, Green Clean certified uh, dispensary and grow uh, in Los Angeles, uh, which led eventually, a, it was a, more of a research and collecting data type of collective. So we were really interested in the, uh, what strains were performing pre pre predictable outcomes for patients. And then um, out of that came Honey, which was commonly known back then as Honey Vape, we're the first distillate cartridge in, um, I guess in America, essentially, short path distillate. And it took off and I had a responsibility there. So the, the company is called Honey. Um, also known as Honey Babe, and we extended out our product lines, and it's a premium product with um, predictable outcomes. Um, that helped fuel, you know, the type of relationships I've built now across the country, which are more, uh, I guess, research and development. And uh, we're now in eight different states, the United States, through licensing agreements, and I have lots and lots of stories for everybody. <laughs> And I met Peter, when did we meet? Was it 2013, I guess, or maybe you, oh, 2011. And we got the vapes going for you uh, earlier around then. So I, as Jim said, I've got a bachelor's in biochemistry from Lebanon Valley College in Pennsylvania. And I moved out to Southern California for USC graduate work, uh, get my PhD in synthetic organic chemistry. So I'd worked in building drug discovery molecules, new, new molecular entities and scaffolds via new synthetic methods methodologies um, and became interested in the cannabis plant in 2008. So around the end of that year, my brother was making, well, was working at a construction company and was asked to build a storefront dispensary. And I had no idea what that meant, but he said it was legal to dispense marijuana or cannabis, which I said could not be possible. Um, but it was, there was laws in, in California, Peter being one of the early pioneers knew that very well. Um, and we started as a testing lab in 2010. And I think anyone that's been out in the cannabis space for a while probably has told you they've got multiple business models, different types of experience for figuring out how to navigate the shifting sands of changing legal and regulatory landscapes. So while we started as a testing lab, we still have analytical testing foundations. It's still a very big key fundamental part of what we do, helps us with product formulation, product standardization. Today, we provide terpene-based ingredients to a number of brands. Uh, we consult for manufacturing facilities, how to construct them, lay them out, and build them up with standard operating procedures from the ground up, and implementing new processes for new product forms, licensing, intellectual property. We've got a patent portfolio of about almost 20 patents now, um, that have issued around the world, uh, most of them being terpene based or manufacturing based around new products and product forms. And happy to share a number of our stories that that we have earned uh, the hard way and you know across the way uh, over the years here so far. And thank you guys for the opportunity. Great. So yeah, wanted to learn a little bit more kind of about um, your backgrounds. I know that from talking with Dr. Lincoln now. Um, kind of Peter to you, uh, dealing with kind of those early days of, of um, getting into the marketplace, certainly talking about transitioning um, legacy market operators, um, kind of going back to the to the 96 uh, passage of medical cannabis, 
wanted to hear a little bit more about some stories that you have about those kind of difficulties in regulation, um, kind of gray areas. Um, is there anything that really stands out to you in terms of um, kind of a how far we've come moment uh, as you look back on it uh, in terms of the, your experience? Sure. I. Uh, how about the lack of regulations? <laughs> It's just to start right there. I was like craving for regulations back when I started out, um, uh, let's say pursuing cannabis as like, I knew it was the next breaking medical, you know, so solution, let's call it. Like they we're missing something as cannabis because it worked for me. And uh, that's all we had was a law called Prop 215, which was super, super gray kind of allowed for collectives and you know the dispensary part of that was really a collective dispensary bolt-on type of thing um very murky very dangerous your test you had to go out there and test you know what your local municipality was willing to enforce and then defend it um so very scary times <laughs> very, very, very scary times um but I was committed to it because from the medical perspective, I was a true believer because what it had done for me. So I was willing to take those risks. Never would do it again. And then we fought really hard in California. Never, never do it again. The, uh, we just fought really hard to get regulations in place, sensible regulations in place in California when it looked for sure that they were going to pass a medical law, which subsequently got the dovetailed into adult use in Prop 64. And the only way to do that was to basically hire lobbyists and get the groups of like-minded individuals uh, at this time would have been manufacturers. That's why, you know, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of this uh, California Manufacturers Association. Jeff is a, a part of that organization, very, very important part of it. Um, we just had to have a voice with legislators so we wouldn't get thrown in jail. Um, and we could, you know, we wanted uh, products that were tested because what led me to form my own collective was I knew that the supply chain was contaminated. I knew if we were going to be making, growing medical cannabis and making products out of it, it started with clean plants. Otherwise, uh, you'd be poisoning patients that really were trying to find relief. Um, but now that you get the regulations in place, then it's about implementing them. And that becomes the next thing. Everyone thinks like, yeah, we're legal, the law passed. Uh, no, now you have to uh get legislators to deploy departments that can regulate your activity uh, and that can be very challenging because they can just administratively make arbitrary rules without science involved uh, which jeff can speak to for sure um, once you get all that in place then you have to uh enter the marketplace and there will be a lot of competition i don't think any state is going to ever roll out like california Oregon and kind of Arizona um, while we built the, sh the, the plane while flying it. Now you're going to have legislation, you're going to have regulators. You have to participate in that to understand what the rules are and if they make sense because there's a taboo around cannabis sometimes and they try to overregulate it and overtax it. Um, but then you're going to have to be able to stand up a, a company that has products that people want. And that would be like, my journey from soup to nuts on how I look at the business aspect of the of the, of the marketplace and territories like Pennsylvania is very unique compared to other states and regulations. And you're going through it right now with that ban on terpenes that's been stayed as an ingredient. It's a wild one. Yeah. It's a wild one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I, you know, my expertise started in cultivation. A lot of people forget that's what I really do. Breed cannabis, cultivate cannabis, try to find unique strains and outcomes. Um, it goes from breeding cannabis or running dispensaries or you know, indoor grows, greenhouses, full sun, manufacturing, you know, relationships that are needed for all that. So there's, I can always open the floor when it's ready and be very knowledgeable in all aspects of that. So what are some of like the most important regulations that you've seen from the start of, and, and this is for, for both of you as well, um, the most important regulations and, and maybe even as we transition from kind of legacy market, fully illegal to medicinal, um, and then also kind of medicinal to adult use, what are those kind of most important regulations 
from uh, the business aspect for Peter and then kind of also the, the testing um, and kind of scientific aspect from, from Dr. Raver. And they go hand in hand. Like mm-hmm. uh, you can't have a regulated market without testing. It's the, the single most important, in my opinion, piece of the whole puzzle. You have to be able to make ethical products for your consumers. But Jeff, I, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, when we first started, people were like, you can test it. <laughs> right? It was it was really kind of a, a foreign concept. Do you have a special weed testing machine that's going to do this? Um, no, we do not. We use an HPLC standard, you know, technology that was used in pharmaceutical industry. It was actually debated when we first started, should we use gas chromatography or liquid chromatography? Um, and we were the first to come out with liquid chromatography so that we could see the cannabinoid acids and the neutral decarboxylated cannabinoids. Gas chromatography is great for court. That's why the DEA and all the other, you know, authorities have been using that to say this is how much THC you have. It's much easier to have a conversation in court about this is a criminal above these thresholds. It's it's marijuana. If you were to say it's all THCA and that's non psychoactive, you know, people's heads might explode in the jury box, and that gets more complicated than you'd want. So it was cheaper to run a gas chromatograph and easier, but that didn't give patients the best information. It doesn't give you accurate, quantifiable information on what you have or what you are converting if you're doing um, manufacturing and, and trying to provide standardized, consistent products. So I think the idea that you could test it was, you know, first and foremost, second, okay, now that you're testing, if I put just a THC number on a label, everybody assumed it meant it was tested for everything. So I think there's a general perception about every product that we find in any any retail outlet, whether it's a gas station, a medical cannabis dispensary, the grocery store, that you believe that is fully tested. That is absolutely not true, unfortunately. Sometimes they're tested for some things, sometimes they are not, and probably a good majority of them actually are not tested The cannabis products that we have are really tested to pretty stringent quality standards. Um, We had the benefit of understanding all the things that are not tested and how to roll out regulation. And I think when you see new legislation and regulations, testing, as Peter said, is a very big, important part of it. But which tests are done to which levels? So California wasn't the first to go adult use and it had no formal medical program. So in 2016, when, when the voter initiative passed, they had a chance to say, what have other states been doing? What did they do? And now new states like New York have the benefit of all these other states that have got a body of knowledge and experience to say, here's what we're testing for. Here's when we test the products and which part of the supply chain and what are those limits set to? So in California, they set limits on pesticides that was basically almost that you can't detect it. So push the analytical limits of the most sensitive technology to find certain pesticides that we want to pretty much say there's never any of them there. You can't test for zero, but let's test for, you know, 0.00001 and and say that if you can detect it, that is a fail. Um, Not every state does that. California has a lot of pesticides that they look for. Canada looks for like 99. California's looking for about 67 right about now. Um, But heavy metals were also included, residual solvents and things like that. So the the regulation, you know, testing's new to a lot of operators without regulations. So adapting to that, when do I have to test my products? What might I not be able to utilize in the cultivation or manufacturing practice anymore? How do I adapt my methodology so that I can have a compliance test that says I'm going to get into the marketplace. I think that's one of the the bigger ones and it relates also to labeling. So you've got hopefully a good label that says what's in the product, you know, what your accurate quantifiable amounts are. You've got assurance that you don't have pesticides, heavy metals, residual solvents or other contaminants, mycotoxins and things. And that's a big step of evolution in coming from a, a legacy market into a regulated one. And we see it adapt very quickly. So someone might have like one batch fail and the next time they do not. They, they ask around, they find their information and really adapt to that rather quickly. Um, and I think all of that is definitely for the benefit of the consumers and the patients. But it is probably one of the ones that trips up new regulators if they don't have scientists on staff or haven't been doing you know, food, ag, and pharmaceutical type things before. The federal government mostly does that. So some of these states didn't have the benefits of that. 
Um, it is interesting to talk to the Department of Taxation in Nevada about chemistry and testing or the Department of, you know, um, any of the tax collectors in other states. They're just like, I'm a liquor guy. I don't know much about what we test for. Um, you know, it's not really these types of problems that you have with cannabis. And cannabis is every product that you could imagine, right? Infused products, edible products, inhalable products. Um, there's a lot to, to handle for new regulators and lawmakers in that regard. So it's a big educational effort. And then, and Peter, you probably have a lot of other experience with, you know, manufacturing rights. How do I build my facility? How do I go ahead and, and just operate with metric and track and trace and other pieces that add tons of cost, time, effort, labor, um, dynamic labeling and things of that type, which can be very different from state to state as well. It is indeed. I would say, once we have all our testing out of the way um, and how it, it's going to be facilitated within a territory or state, uh, the, my biggest concern when it comes to these rollouts of legalization of cannabis would be inclusion of the traditional market. And where I see them always failing is, I mean, even with social justice or social equity, they're failing because they're kind of like trapping them. Um, you got to include the traditional market, the guys that are, were in it originally. If you don't and you exclude them, you put a barrier, they, most of them, I would say, are doing it to make money. Like, there's nothing wrong with making money, growing weed and selling it. But um, if you exclude them, they are highly incentivized to stay clandestine and run their own channel, their own supply channel, because especially in California. I, I can explain this to you, Cal, how California works. Like cal cannabis in California, those are, everyone that's, you say California, I guarantee you they think something on the top three cannabis is gonna, it will fall in there. We've been using it. You've been getting it from Bob down the street or my buddy Kenny over there in Venice. And, uh, you know, we're just fine. Now we're, now you have, because of overtaxation and exclusion in the marketplace, you have these escalated costs to the consumer. And they're like, okay, well, now Kenny's making gummies down there and it's half the price. So what it does is you have a sizable capital output to stay regulated and compliant within a state. And in that I would say is the best thing for consumers, tested regulated products but you're not incentivizing them enough when it, the prices are too high. You're only incentivizing the illicit market, which will continue to thrive. Look what's happening in New York right now. They couldn't get their thing together, get their, get their licenses out to have enough retail to support the demand. And every illicit market you can think of is running wild and profitable in New York. And to rail that, reel that back in, if you lose control of it, as California is has drastic devastating effects to the people who are trying to do it right. Okay, it's not easy um, when you have that that ghost competitor, and I don't think that's good for any any of us. You know, we need our products. We need to know that they're safe. And that'll, that'll always be my my mo is product safety. Right? So. Yep. Uh, that's my biggest fear, how these new territories are rolling out, over-regulating, creating obstacles, barriers to the traditional market, which should be included. A lot of the most craziest, innovative stuff comes out of these guys, right? I mean, me being one of them, essentially, because we were, you know, I was licensed and had my license and everything uh, pre-state uh, regulation, but, you know, uh, you had to get creative, so. Well, and some states actually have poor regulations that don't even permit uh, new sample types or sample products to be going out there and being sampled. So they expect you to make a full production batch, fully test it, spend all the costs on that, and just try to sell it without anyone giving you feedback. Did it taste good? Was it the right you know, product or is it even the right dosage? So product innovation in some places is even stifled by that. Um, and that, that can be a difficult one to, to wrestle with. 
And just to give a little perspective, in California, there are about five um, unlicensed dispensaries per every one that is licensed. So you have, you know, gotten a partner in the government. They take, you know, 30 to 40 percent via taxes now. Um, your prices are higher. You've got to do a lot of things to comply with that. You may be getting in trouble if you don't comply with that. And you've got a competitor that has none of those expenses, none of those supply chain issues, and can just go out there and do whatever they want um, at higher doses often because they don't have potency limitations on packages or per unit sizes. Um, it's a very difficult you know, competitor to go up against every single day. What do you guys think are kind of, because we're talking a lot about barriers here, um, for the legacy market to be incorporated in. And, and certainly, as we see, I'm always fascinated with looking at places like Michigan who do not have um, license caps or anything like that. What do you guys think, if you're going to advise, say, like a state like Pennsylvania, who's looking to transition from medical to adult use? Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with kind of two of the floating bills that are out there right now. One is um, planning to go through kind of like the state liquor system doing state stores, things like that. Certainly that won't help the legacy market as well to, to kind of create generational wealth through, through business owning opportunities. But what do you guys think are, are kind of cornerstone kind of regulations or, or, or things that need to be included in order to help legal businesses, but also help legacy market to become legal businesses? Can I go on that? Sure. Uh, now in hindsight, I was all for uh, very strict guidelines and limiting how many licenses were out there. That is not the solution for sure. The, the customer, consumer and adult use or patient and medical needs safe access. And that means they need access. So I'm now very much in, in support of no caps on licensing. Somebody wants to spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars, 150, whatever that number may be to build out their facility because they think that they could be successful in the marketplace, by all means, let them do that and let the market settle in itself. But the most important thing is that there's enough ample retail and access to customers or patients for them to get you know, the products. Um, that is what will alleviate this illicit market situation that always pops up. It looks like everywhere, right? Maybe Massachusetts has less of a problem with it. And definitely Arizona and Florida got it down. But they also went with big boy players, limited, very, very strict limited marketplace. And um, uh, it's like a closed system. Florida's just kind of opening up. And their law enforcement is extremely strong in Florida and Arizona. So they will just arrest you and throw you in jail, like you should be, potentially, right? If you're if you're in that market. Um, so that's what I would I would say. Like, do not have caps. Let the let the market settle its affairs. But then you know who's playing in the marketplace. Yep. And and I agree with that. I think proliferating access. So I think local control in California was what was deemed to say, like, we'll get the voter initiative passed. Like, that's how we can get it there. But that allowed the large majority of municipalities to say no to any cannabis activities. And unfortunately, it also said, like, the voter initiative also had in there that it's now just misdemeanors. It's not really criminal infractions. So there's no teeth to those that will you know, go ahead and not get a license and continue to operate. And the ones that want to follow the rules and be good actors are not allowed to go into the majority of local municipalities. So you don't have access everywhere. So I would say, you know, no caps on distribution and uh, retail for sure. Like just let that go. Let the market decide where is the right number, how many should be there. And maybe, you know, local municipalities can say, hey, we only want a certain number of them or in some jurisdiction, you know, within our neighborhoods. We don't want them next to a school, obviously, that there's some sensibility that should happen there. But you should have low license fees. You should lower the barriers to entries, have a lot of folks that can process these applications as fast as possible and really just get everybody out there and say, go ahead and let the market decide. Um, it will bring lower costs. It will bring about the good operators that will you know, be able to survive. It will bring a rush of capital that will then fund them to say, great, we can all go after it. Um, and I think those places that try to hyper-restrict things, that you know that may be a baby step in some directions but it doesn't really enable everyone to go out there and be entrepreneurs which i think some of us would really like to see with cannabis 
Um, and it, it just, it doesn't work if you don't have a, an enforcement element that goes to those that do not have licenses. I think that the, the combination of those things is really crushing California right now. But again, I will point to Arizona and in Florida where, you know, I they have strong enforcement. <laughs> they have strong enforcement. They really limited it. It's really an MSO publicly traded company type of market or highly capitalized um, operators in there. And I'm a competition free marketplace person, but it, it's got to be one or the other. Like you have to, the, the regulators, the state, people in the state have to decide to, hey, we just want guys that can just like crush it down and kick out whatever, you know, very consistently, let them open up as many stores as they want. They seem to be the winners. Um, and we'd rather work with those types of uh, companies and publicly traded companies that are fully reporting or hey, we want this to be an injection of, of, of capitalism and um, I guess the into the economy, not through taxation by generating revenues and jobs. Um, if that's their approach, which I love, personally, I love giving people jobs um, and making people money, that's, you got to open it up. You got you to gotta open it up and let everybody open up their stores and, and, and just wait for the market to correct itself. Um, which takes about five years. And I think Oregon and Washington aren't terrible models to look at in that respect, yeah, right? There's wide true. open licensing. Go ahead. The, um, Washington started with a tax that was too high, then lowered it, and the the you know legacy market operators disappeared that way. Oregon's like, let's let everyone do it. They actually got overwhelmed with the amount of cultivation uh, licenses where they ended up sticking about a thousand of them in a, a file cabinet and just said, you know what, we're just not going to process those because there's probably too much risk of diversion. So there is always balance. Um, but, you know, if you let the, the starting gun go off and you say everybody can get a shot at it and we can process these things fast enough, you know, you can kind of learn to balance that system as well. But I think they did a pretty decent job. And even Colorado tried to, you know, let a lot of folks out there. And now you're seeing the market dynamics of less, you know, folks go in there, the numbers are slowing down and places are closing. And that's, you're going to have to live with that. Not everyone's going to be successful, but I think it's only fair if everybody gets a shot, then, you know, did you figure out how to navigate it and get through it? It's better to say we had a lot of people take a shot and a lot of people failed, but they all got a chance rather than we gave it to 10. And now we've got 10 people that aren't the greatest of actors and they've raised prices. And, you know, we're not really so sure about those, but it tried to make our enforcement life easier because we thought we could only watch 10. Like we often see legislators and, and regulators say we don't want a large number of them because we're fearful we won't be able to watch them closely. We'll just staff it up well enough. Um, you know, there are license fees. There's plenty of tax revenue. Just as that's part of the plan. Plan, then you should be able to go out and manage that well enough. And over time, you'll get the right number for your size, you know, demographic and state. So a question came through in there on, on Michigan, and that was one I wanted to throw in there, like Michigan, Oregon, Washington. I, I really like how Michigan rolled out their program. You know, the, there's a huge demand for cannabis consumption. It's always been there. It's kind of like upstate New York. Yeah. Um, and the... They, they, they've done a good job. What, what do you want to tell you? I think they've done a great job opening up that marketplace. It went very fast. I think they did do a well, you know, really good job. Yeah. They had a little bit of a running head start from their medical program. Um, but I think that that's probably a better place to be. And we'll see them, you know, kind of come to balance. Other, they allowed products from other places to get that place going before people even <laughs> built out. Which, did they allow it or just the, they just It was <laughs> happening, I think. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like, where do the seeds come from? Where's the starting material come from? Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of a, we know this might happen initially, but it's for the best interest of getting everybody to kind of get going um, before facilities are built and other stuff like that. So I don't think that they did a terrible job. They're policing their labs really well. They're trying to, you know, enforce that that stuff is going correct, you know, going correctly and finding good ethical actors. Um, and I think, you know, it's never perfect, like, especially not in the beginning. So you have to start as best you can, which you can do better today based on all the information you've got from every other state. Talk to those regulators before you set stuff up. And hopefully the lawmakers can get a sense of what they should enable the regulators later to do and then say all right we're out we're out of the gate let's start trying to optimize and perfect as we go um you know just try and strive for perfection knowing that you're probably never going to get there but get as close as possible as fast as you can and i think michigan's showing a pretty good example of how to do that pretty well definitely 
No point the best. Hey, um, what kind of track and trace system do you use in Pennsylvania? I thought, did they use metric? I can't remember if that was, um, I don't remember which one that is. Which, which data? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's MJ, MJ, Freeway. MJ Freeway. MJ Freeway, that's oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah. No only but a goodie. I didn't even know. <laughs> really? They still MJ exist. MJ Freeway? Is it bio, did they merge with BioTrack or no? They still yeah. stay. Okay. Yeah, on their own. <clears throat> they just went to MJ. We used to use stones and tablets that we would. <clears throat> okay, so the state allows you to pick which one to use. No, no, no. I was kidding. They, <laughs> we're, we're literally using the worst of the worst. Uh, oh, stones and tablets. I get it. Now. Yeah. Well, the state of Washington came out with Biotrack. Then they pulled the contract and said everybody has to keep things in spreadsheets. Yeah. And then, you know, they're trying to bring in the new ones. So it's sometimes that can be painful too. Um, but, you know, I think if you have something, it's better than nothing. And then you can adapt that one as well. Um, yeah, the that, that's an important been, element of it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it doesn't slow us down. I mean, we just you enter the data. You know, you, you, the rules. Yep, you hire one to two people to start entering data, depending how much you need yeah. to put in there. Um, but, you know, it's but, uh, it's an important piece for sure. Definitely. I mean, we're all moving to more automation and AI and stuff like that. You need to have a track and trace system that you can, the state can always go back on. So people can commit sins, but they're not going to be able to hide it if a true audit goes down. It, it's really difficult, especially with all the stuff that everyone's learned over the last few years. Yeah. Jeffrey, didn't the reason um, Washington stick with spreadsheets is because the MG Freeway implementation failed like two yep. years ago? Yep. It just was not not <laughs> adequate. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I so like that. I think metric. Yeah, is metric seems to be the winning one so far. Um, people can deal with it. It works for most of what it needs to do. I think it wasn't really good for manufacturing out of the gate, but they've made great improvements. I know a number of folks in Oregon talked to them for a long time about how some of the manufacturing works so they could kind of update it. And I think they've gotten that to a much better place now. Yeah, I, we lecture on that at business school and, and law school and my marijuana classes. And uh, metric seems to be the model that most are wanting to follow and follow. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's good. It's good now. Yeah, makes sense. Um, you could also ask, can you speak about the chaos in Virginia? Yeah. One thing Peter and I don't have is a crystal ball. We don't predict much of any, anything out here. Um, I, if I were to say the number of predictions I thought I might have and how many were accurate, but that would be a miserable score. You know, very, very low. The rate of change is much lower than I ever thought. Um, you know, so some things may happen, just definitely not on the time scale that you might think. And I think like Virginia and some of the e other East Coast states are demonstrating it. So we think we have licenses selected. Now we're going to be marred in legal battles and no one's really sure of what to do. And we're going to start taking steps backwards. Um, absolutely horrific for patients, right? If you were to say, here's some access to something and then their medicine is pulled from them, I couldn't think of anything that's much more cruel than that if they found something that finally worked and then it disappears. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we just have everybody trying to say, I think it's my next pot of gold. It's my next way of making so much money. So I'll throw all these legal resources at it to slow down my competitor or gum up the works for others rather than saying, you know, hey, we should let something proliferate while we try and argue that we should also be included or go change the law so that other people get it included. Um, I think that what we're seeing on some of those limited license East Coast states is pretty, pretty ineffective and pretty difficult to watch. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in some of those states that are not happy with that and, and are actually suffering. So it's pretty difficult for sure. Yeah, I would think the one crystal ball I have in cannabis is whatever time frame you think it's going to roll out on, it will not. It will not. From the very beginning, when you start with legalization, there's always going to be setbacks. You have different frac factions fighting. Uh, there's a very strong anti-cannabis uh, lobby group that will come in under the guise of like permitting is not fair. And Sue, you saw that, I think, in, uh, well, definitely New York. That was one of them in California. There's a test case. I think that one got dismissed finally. But uh you know, the court system's a very good tactic on delaying things rolling out and then po politicians not uh, agreeing on the regulations and so forth and so on. You're just going to be, it's way longer. Just plan. I had no idea 
23 years later. That Build a fantastic model, divide your revenue by 10, and multiply your timelines by three to five. And you may get closer. <laughs> yep, it's absolutely very long. So if you're going to do it, it's a long-term commitment. And you got to put that in your head and know it. Just, just, just know it's a long-term commitment if you actually want to open a business in the cannabis space. I don't care where you are. It takes a while. I've had many, many, many folks say, man, if I would have known what I was getting into, I wouldn't have done it. And I, many entrepreneurs say that about most all of what, the, what they do. But I think here there's a perception that I can get rich quick. I can just throw some seeds in the ground. Money grows on trees and it won't be, you know, any, it won't be difficult to be successful, but it couldn't be further from the truth. I think the bar is never higher. The scrutiny is never higher than you're going to get in this industry. And, you know, shifting regulations and legislations where things may change on a dime and all of a sudden you've got to scrap a hundred thousand units of packaging because it was wrong those can be super costly and detrimental to small businesses and they do happen so it's it's how do you be prepared for next to anything and how do you weather through all of that adversity uh it really is a test of your perseverance i think to kind of go through this one so it shouldn't be for the faint of heart but we don't want to discourage anybody you know give it a shot just go in eyes wide open with what you know you're getting into so going back to um kind of social equity um thing or regulations or things that have worked and not worked uh, is there anything that stands out to you um from certain states about certain initiatives that they have for me at least my example would be uh, up in massachusetts they're now trying to license or at least provide certain licenses for people who come from certain zip codes, lower income zip codes. Um, certainly we saw with Ohio, you cannot um, license based on race uh, due to the 14th Amendment, um, Equal Protections Clause. Um, wanted to just see your thoughts, uh, both Peter and Jeff, about kind of how do we uh, help encourage or even protect uh, black and brown owned businesses um, from communities disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs to, to really thrive in this marketplace. Certainly understanding that really letting the marketplace decide is going to be a great idea, but as well um, kind of protecting some of those legacy market operators who have either served time or been targeted. Well, having uh, been there for the rollout of the first social equity program ever in Oakland and advising uh, Greg Miner at City of Oakland for the Special Permits Division, and then getting it through their you know, their, their council um, I would say social equity is definitely, I would say social justice is, uh, a, a, an important co component and we should definitely support it and make sure that people that have been persecuted for cannabis have access to be participating in the business that they throw them in jail for, even if it's for smoking a joint. Um, it's just how you roll it out. And I call it like a social equity prison. If you allow a certain number of licenses to be available and then you have your standard it should never be based on race but it should be based off of social justice i'm not a i don't like how this whole social equity social justice program got hijacked and now turned into a race issue it's never oakland didn't even roll it out that way it just works the math works out that way you know most brown people have been arrested for cannabis it's like 80 percent or 75 percent of all the arrests so it's just going to come out and bake out into the the numbers so let's just keep it social justice and 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 give these people access to it but then how do you give them access to it and this is where i think it was instrumental in oakland yes i in just oakland. put on there needs to be a mentoring program on that you can't there has, I, I believe there needs to be a mentoring program on that because you can't just throw these, these people that they have been locked up and incarcerated and do not have as much access to capital or business know-how and everything and think they're going to be successful. And now it's like, great, here's your freaking license. Great, but now we can get these other guys licensed. These guys are still going to be behind. So there, all these states, I don't see ever a, uh, a, a mentoring type of program. Uh, where Oakland, we were trying to do a mentoring program with Oakland. Uh, so, hey, listen, no one's giving up 51% of their business. And how is that all, how are these people going to like raise money? You, you know, let's do a mentoring program. They own their own business. And then we are required to mentor them. That turned in, just give them three, three free years of, of space. Rent a building for them or let them have a, a, a space in your thing, which is better than nothing. We'll take it, right? 
the problem is that because they didn't have strong leadership and mentoring, a lot of these social equity businesses failed. Uh, there's very few uh, real champions up there in Oakland. Same case goes for each state, state by state. There's this, now there's a the social equity component with no tie-in to business mentoring. So they're forced to game out the system essentially. And um, they're really not in control of their businesses. They're not able actually to build their own businesses. It's really the guys that want the license that are using the social equity by name to get, get acquire, control, fund, and build them out. Um, so until the states kind of figure that out, um, I'm not a big fan of how any of the states have rolled it out, to be honest with you. And until they, they get it, they, there should be an equal amount of social equity or social justice permits with the open market. You just go one for one. One gets issued, another one gets issued. One gets issued, another one gets issued. And like Jeff said, like when you open up all this access, don't worry, the market will adjust. You can't expect every social justice uh, licensee to be successful, just like we can't like the regular permits. But the competition and the alignment and the networking, if it were required, I think will produce a much more successful social justice program in these states that are trying to bake it out and feel good about themselves. Because I, I personally think it's lip service. Um, only Oakland was serious. Oakland wasn't messing around. <laughs> <laughs> they were very, very, very serious, and they forced people to do it. Um, whereas the, these other programs, I'm, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sold. I don't think we have a very good model yet. I don't think we've seen someone that's figured it out or, or known, you know, the golden equation to to that one. Um, but I, I do think, you know, like mentorship or support, and maybe you could facilitate it via grant grant funding or other types of money that says, hey, this is money that's earmarked for you to go engage business professionals and accounting professionals and other people that could support it. Here's how to cover the rent for the next two years, or here's some dedicated facilities or buildings so you're not bogged down with that and you can kind of get a running head start. Um, you know, ways to support the business and say, here's your opportunity and, and you know, and bring them you know, the opportunity at the same time or even before others, like at the same time, one for one, I think that's a fantastic idea. My biochemistry professor always said, everything will go to equilibrium. So you're just trying to set up like your equilibrium picture to say, what will the market try and find balance within? If I'm including everybody, it will find hopefully a nice homeostasis across society and say, there's something for everyone. Somebody's got different types of products. Someone's got a different type of feel about their dispensary than others. And yet somebody, you know, enough people like those that they can thrive as a successful business. But running a compliant business, you know, complying with tax reporting, complying with accounting pieces and employment pieces. Um, you know, I'm a scientist by training and I get to do next to no science. It feels like every other day when you run a business, it's finances, insurance, you know, regulation, stuff that'll make you go mad um, and definitely is not as fun as some of the other pieces. So if we're trying to support other entrepreneurs to put pieces around them for folks that serve those functions and can train them and educate them, you can learn a lot through experience and on the fly, but you've got to have the right folks that have that experience to begin with, or you'll just endlessly make mistakes. So I think, you know, grant funding or, you know, really low level interest loans to these types of operators to say, here's your, your chance to go after it. Because access to capital is not going to come friendly or with terms that anyone's going to understand. If you're going to get the first position as an, an equity license and someone's going to say, here, look, I'll give you this tons of money and this documentation is great for you. You're like, that's like 500 pages of stuff I've never seen before in my life. And there must be like a million traps in here. But I want that money in this chance so okay i guess i'll sign it and see what happens and yeah later you've lost everything and you know they took it all from you that's going to be set up in these types of scenarios i don't think we're really enabling them to go about it on their own or supporting them to do so it's kind of like let's hold them up in lip service but it's not really going to make them successful operators unfortunately and it's hard it's hard to be a successful entrepreneur so there's got to be a lot that goes with that but i don't think we see a good model for how to go about it yet today unfortunately i, I want to expound on my social equity prison uh theory and that prison is almost i think every one of them because I'm, I'm really active in here quietly looking at every every state. 
they require the social equity holder to hold their per permit for a certain period of time. Some do not even have a time period. It's just, you know, it's only social equity. And I would say, you know, in some people and many, many, many entrepreneurs, part of real good business is your exit, right? So yeah, I build a business, I'm going to build it up, I'm going to sell it off. So if a social equity candidate wins a license in Brooklyn, New York, okay, one of the first, and someone wants to pay him $14 million for that license, he should absolutely be able to uh, cash out on it. 100%. What are we trying to do here? It's supposed to be, I, to me, it's like a, re, a reparations program to me for the war on drugs, okay? Well, they've lost a whole chunk of their life. Like, you're now going to make them keep working, falling into more traps, making more mistakes. When someone wants to pay them $14 million for their license, they should go, thank you, goodbye. And now whoever's putting up $14 million, go ahead and have it. Have at it. Um, and I think that's probably the, the, the fatal fall, Jeff, and everybody on this thing is that they are not allowing the social equity candidates or the winners to exit. And that is, I think, un-American, non-capitalist, and it's not accomplishing anything. It's like, even if it's a million dollars, a million dollars is a lot of freaking money. Um, and I should be able to decide what I want, my asset, how I, if I want to sell it, and you're making me hold on to one asset so I can eventually get overrun by well capitalized individuals. It's the stupidest thing, and they need to lift that. And then I think that was going to be really a linchpin if they put that component in. If somebody's brave enough to do that component, and let let the social equity guys exit, the time and place of their choosing. Government's not supporting it. It's not costing any taxpayer anything. Matter of fact, they're going to make more money. So that's my uh, my spiel on that. It, uh, that's I think the fatal flaw in these these programs. Great. So we have a, a question in the chat, um, probably a little bit more aimed uh, towards Dr. Raber. Um, could you speak to the evolution of data quality and testing uh, for percent concentrations of cannabinoids and terpenes? Um, and then kind of also working with state databases. Um, are there any sort of caveats that we should keep in mind um, with kind of reporting and uh, yeah. test quality? Yeah, always remember garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so, right, like what, what kind of data is going in, it really relates to what's coming out. Um, a lot of early labs have a very difficult time getting much of anything done properly. So I think we're in a better place now where the equipment manufacturers are kind of offering a, a validated method or a reasonably good method that says, hey, this will get you fairly accurate numbers, especially for cannabinoids. So cannabinoids are not that difficult. They're pretty plentiful. They're not super low concentrations. Um, you can run methods where you can understand and separate a good number of them in a reasonable amount of time. So testing labs are always trying to run as many samples through the same piece of equipment that they can. That might lend towards shorter run times, which might lead towards putting two or three different components on top of each other and misreporting or misreporting the concentrations of those. So the, the new modern equipment is better at running things faster with great resolution, so you can kind of avoid some of that. And new methods are pretty robust. Um, most things are pretty well worked out fairly well for the plant and for concentrates. But infused products, they're kind of all their own individual animal. So you don't go treat, and someone really needs to keep telling California this, by the way, you can't treat your chocolate bar the same way you do your gummy bear or your gummy, you know, infused gummy square, I should say. Not allowed to have animals too attractive for kids, even though they're not allowed access into the dispensaries. Um, you can't analyze that you can't prep that sample the same and run that the same way. So I can't do my extraction to get every bit of the cannabinoid out of chocolate the same as I could out of a gummy product or other infused baked goods or something of that type or a beverage, for example. So every infused product is its own unique methodology. And I think those things are far more difficult and much more lower data quality than you would say for just flour. So pretty much most folks can get just flour. The USP has kind of some recommendations on like, here's how we'll test flour, um, you know, plant material, biomass, and concentrates are pretty much like flour with less stuff. So it's a little easier to get to, provided you adjust for the concentration, which is not a difficult piece to do. So I think 
that, you know, that class is pretty easily handled, but infused products, definitely very difficult. Beverages, topicals, other types of ones that might represent challenging matrices can be exceptionally challenging. So, you know, that's for cannabinoids. Terpenes, whole other ball of wax, a lot bigger animal, much more complexity, many other things that might be on top of each other, a lot more difficult to get all of those right. So we might see some things. We know we're seeing some things misreported. We're like, we've never seen this before, but people keep saying this. Um, something's going on here. And that's where you're trying to push two or three or even five different components on top of each other and saying, here's a bigger number. Unfortunately, the market is starting to reward folks for larger numbers, right? So I have 7% terpenes in my product. Maybe not, um, <laughs> right? And the number may go up if I report more. So I'm kind of motivated to drive the numbers up and I probably am not doing as great a job because to get that type of analytical data right, I might need to run the machine for an hour per sample as opposed to the 10 minutes that my capitalistic mindset might want me to. So terpene data quality, I think, is much, much lower than the cannabinoid data quality today. Cannabinoid on infused products is probably not quite as great. That's a little bit more lab specific and independent. Um, I've talked with a number of labs that you're like, you're never going to get that right if you're going this way on that infused product. And there's not a whole bunch of people that could offer answers um, to go ahead and do that. To develop a method specific for each you know, product type is very time consuming, costly, and a lot of labs you know, can't even afford to charge for that. The, the clients are just like, I'll just go to someone else that prints out a number for me. Um, so I think the quality of that is not as good as we would all like. All of, almost, I won't say all, but most of the states, unfortunately, have a potency inflation problem where everyone is skewing the numbers a lot higher than, than what they actually really should be. Um, you know, you can see there's like one or two labs here and there that they're, they're getting numbers that are in the 20s and they're not even, you know, asked to test for anyone else because everyone says, I need a 30 or higher. Um, the plant didn't magically get bred over the course of a year, even two, to go from 20% THC to all of a sudden up to almost 40%, like we're seeing on the labels. It is, um, unfortunately, the way the labs are testing the products that we're seeing that. So if you're seeing numbers that are up over 25, 30% consistently, I question the quality of that data. I don't think that that's really as accurate as it could be um, from a flower perspective. So, uh, you know, today's data... If everyone's doing the same things, you can say, here's some relative correlations, but if I'm going to be accurate and, you know, my number says it's 18% and someone else is reporting 28, well, now your dosing pictures are off. How much people are consuming is all off. And it's really hard to draw conclusions from any of those reported pieces because the testing values just simply aren't accurate enough to do so. Even if you're taking it in aggregate and get a general feel for where it's going, like people use more of this product than that product, that's probably fine. But if I say they like this dose better than that dose, I probably can't draw many of those conclusions yet today, unfortunately. Yeah, and that actually segues perfect into the next question. Um, Tron points out that uh, last year, reports on fraudulent cannabis tests led to lawsuits and numerous allegations. Um, just wanted to see if you knew anything about um, any updates on those lawsuits or how they've moved forward. I've only heard of more coming, <laughs> so I think there are more. Um, I believe there will be many more consumer you know, advocates coming out there to say, you lied to me about how you made the product. You lied to me about what was in here. You said it was the strongest. Your label said it was the, you know, the most potent. How do you even define potency in cannabis? You know, it's not just one cannabinoid. It's not just one number. We don't really even know. You know, if I have 10 milligrams of THC and certain terpenes, it can feel very different if I have 10 milligrams and a bunch of different terpenes. And that, how individualized is that? We don't really have an answer about this is the strongest or most potent product. Um, so I think the lawyers are going to have a field day. We have seen that some of those are going into court, but they, I don't know if any of them have been concluded as of yet. Um, and I do think they'll, they'll be in state courts, you know, more so than a federal court for sure initially, but the hemp players may bring that into the federal sphere. Um, and you're going to see probably a lot of wild action on that one in the not too distant future as well. Yeah. Especially in the hemp space. If, uh, the FDA gets its struthers and, and finally gets, I think they just passed. They, they, they're allowing the FDA to regulate hemp based products. So that's where Jeff it's Jeff's. Well, they've asked about. Congress to clarify for them that they need to do it. 
So the yeah, FDA yeah. took a long time and said, we don't know what to do. Congress needs to tell us that we're actually allowed to do this and in which ways. They kind of kicked the can back and forth. Um, but I do think, you know, eventually the FDA will have their say and it will be quite interesting. Um, there's the rewriting of the federal farm bill has to happen this year. Um, so that is going to carve out a lot of interesting nuance, especially around what's a hemp derived derivative, what is, you know, another cannabinoid that is permissible or not. Um, I can say with pretty great assurance that there are some things we see in the marketplace today that are not being derived from hemp. Um, we don't know of the cultivars that would even, even enable that to be planted just yet. Um, yet magically you see these molecules showing up almost every other week. Um, that's really unfortunate and not what the intent was. So I think we have a better picture now, what, like which things do we want to permit? What, what types of transformations might we want to see? And the FDA should watch that to make sure there's no impurities or unintended consequences for manufacturing processes that allow something that we don't know about to be in that supply chain. And specifically to make sure Jeff is talking about the hemp industry. Yeah. Which dwarfs hemp is non-state licensed outside dispensary. Yes. It's a big, and uh, big. They're, they're running amok um, and actually making it a bad place for and safe place for, for consumers. So um, I'm really that that's when you're really going to see some really crazy stuff going on. In our, our cannabis regulated space, I think the most the Mo the big greatest disservice was the connection of potency with value and quality. Um, that's why you're incentivizing because there's lack of information about what, what, what defines potency. You know, is it THC? And I, I can assure you it's not. Uh, it's definitely a whole ensemble uh, of phytochemicals in there that equate to potency. However, the consumer believes that the more THC for the dollar I get, they can do math pretty quickly. They're like, that's the best thing. I'm getting the most value. Um, and so it's incentivized labs to cheat. So the, these guys that are pretty sophisticated operators understand that potency game and will only work with labs that will produce results at these higher potencies. And, you know, the shoe's gonna drop eventually. These lawsuits, these consumer lawsuits that get buried, of course they're in state court and there's, emotions made and delays made because usually the companies that are being sued essentially for dishonesty and potency are very large and have very great law firms that will just keep pushing this out of the out of the limelight and it gets buried because there's always a new crazy thing going on in cannabis you know like it's fallacious so there's always a new headline and all these are being buried and They'll get worked out. It's really the labs that are probably really scared. <laughs> um, and as they should be. As they should be, and, it, and, it, and they're going to have to clean up their act. Um, but they're a lot easier to enforce on. If yep. the local state regulators want to go in and clamp down on labs, which are far and few between compared to brands and manufacturers and cultivators, really easy to clamp down. The only problem, Jeff, is you, we all know, is like, what are their... They, there is no standardization on testing. Yep. It, yep so it really, there really isn't. And uh, getting them to agree and, and actually understand that, it's very difficult. And Jeff, I mean, God bless you. He's trying. It never stops. <laughs> um, AOAC <laughs> and ASTM are trying to establish standards. To, if you have aspirin, you know, there's a USP method. Everyone points to that and says, do it this way or do it a way that you can validate will match the results, even if you do it faster or with different modern technology. And that just doesn't quite exist yet for cannabis. But there are a number of folks working on it. I think we'll see some sort of, you know, standardization that we could point to that says, here's a good acceptable method. And then state regulators can kind of say, okay, do that or better um and we'll get there but i think we're a number of years off from that one yet unfortunately yeah and talking about i know that when we had our uh, initial conversation about holding this um, speaker series i talked about that initial transition i know that was very important to you peter about um you had cited that one study talking about how 80 percent of, of the cannabis that was out there um contained kind of dangerous levels of contaminants or um, things of that nature. Just wanted to see if you guys could speak a little bit more towards that and kind of, as we also kind of look towards in, including that within social equity, social justice movements, um, how important that is in terms of helping 
those operators kind of get on that page and, and um, kind of what that mentoring program kind of sounds like could be a valuable aspect of, of a mentoring program or some sort of business incubator um, for those applicants. Are we, so, are we on like social equity? We're speaking specifically about social equity or 80% of products being? Well, no, I believe it was, you guys were talking about when, when California originally went from, um, I think it was like Prop 215 coming in, um, that there was that one study that showed 80% of cannabis like contain that, um, at least legacy market cannabis. Um, does that sound right? Yeah, the, the, yeah, they're mislabeled. They were full of pesticides, some of heavy metals or solvents. Um, untested, unregulated markets have a proliferation of contaminants inside of them from poor cultivation to poor manufacturing practices. When testing is required, you see that cleaned up radically. So you could see that in the transition in California. Some of the um, the data was public about how many failures on compliance tests were there. And, you know, over the first quarter or half a year, you see a pretty good number. And then the number starts going down significantly. Um, and it was not like an un unregulated marketplace where it proliferated. People would add plant growth regulators or something to make sure there were no bugs in them and to make the plants grow bigger. But they're not intended for human consumption and they shouldn't be in a product that I'm definitely going to inhale. Um, so there's, you know, that gets cleaned up when you have legislation and regulation that requires testing. And it gets cleaned up significantly. I think licensed tested marketplaces have greater product quality the, the fun story I like to share was early days of California, an infused product had failed um, for a pesticide. And it turned out it was the olive oil that they were using to <laughs> infuse it into the, the tincture. It was not the cannabis. So, but the end product is what's tested in that, in the cannabis marketplace in California, you take the final package good and test that. So every ingredient gets scrutinized that way. And it was interesting to say my cannabis products cleaner than my food. Um, and I know a number of labs are frustrated with the limits that they have to get to, but it is, some people are using this for medical purposes. They may be immunocompromised and you probably should have that level of purity assurance and standards um, set for those types of products out here. And it, it, I think if you have a licensed regulated market, the product quality is far greater than an unlicensed one. And, and by far within it. And then it actually puts pressure on the traditional market because then it kind of leaches down and everyone's like, hey, is that tested? Does that pesticide? So they, they have to up their game. I would say specifically back in 2019, I call it vapegeddon or the vape crisis when they were poisoning everybody with, they said vitamin E, but I'm 100% certain it was the pesticides because all that failed batches like we talk about and, and you know, God. I don't know, I guess the illicit market didn't give a shit, excuse my language guys, but they just dumped it and they sold it because people wanted access to, they wanted vape cartridges um, and they were poisoning the whole entire supply chain. And then like a crisis like that had to collapse it. So now even like the illicit market, I would say if I were to guess, I mean, uh, maybe a very small percentage of that, especially in the distillate category, is probably contaminated and that's because of regulation. That's because the consumer, you know, it's also because of tragedy at the same time, but it was also because of regulation. So um, what, I, what I fear the most is the hemp industry by far and all these hemp derivatives that come out of there. I think they're, they're not reporting anything correctly and um, they could be very well, you know, because people want safe access to products or really contaminated products for the consumers. And I think that is another bomb waiting to happen unless, you know, unfortunately, federal regulation gets involved in their space. They can stay out of the cannabis space and let the states handle it right now. I don't want to, but those guys, if they're going to be allowed to make these products legally through the Farm Bill, uh, they, there needs to be a higher standard of testing. Great. So I think we're up on time now. Um, thank you guys so much for, for the, taking the time out of your day to, to talk with us. Um, always great to hear from you guys. And I know that Dr. Lincoln now um, has had a great relationship with you guys through, throughout your time working on Kaya and the Los Angeles project. Um, Steve, is there anything else that you want to um, bring up? No, I just wanted to thank again, Peter and Jeff for a great uh, conversation. Uh, very insightful and just a lot of new nuances to kind of 
the industry and kind of what we might look forward to seeing here in Pennsylvania. Keep your seatbelts on. Yeah, yeah, definitely keep your seatbelts on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks everyone for their attention and great questions too. Appreciate that. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks guys.